Buonasera a tutti, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second event of Meetings on Art in conjunction with the 59th edition of the International Art Exhibition, The Milk of Dreams. My name is Cecilia Alemani, I'm the curator of the exhibition. Welcome you all. Um, I would like to begin by thanking all the speakers for accepting our invitation. Thanks everybody for being here and thanks to all our uh, listeners online. Um, I would also like to thank my curatorial team, Marta Papini and in particular Manuela Hansen who has overseen this amazing um, program and also the entire La Biennale team, in particular Jorn Brandmeier, Ilaria Zanella and Francesca Montorio. I'm thrilled to introduce this presentation and discussion around the posthuman turn, which Rosi Braidotti, philosopher and distingu distinguished university professor emerita at Utrecht University, defines as, quote, a convergence phenomenon between post-humanism and post-anthropocentrism. That is to say, the critique of the universal idea of the man of reason on the one hand, and the reject of species supremacy on the other." End quote. Rosi Predotti's post-anthropocentric and post-human feminist theorization is one of the main intellectual frameworks and influence for this exhibition where many of the included artists imagine a post-human condition that deeply resonates with her writings. So I'm very honored that she will commence with a keynote speech, speech on Zoom on her post-human feminism, which is also the title and topic of her latest book published by Politi in November 2021. After the keynote speech, curator and dealer Jeffrey Deitch, who exactly 30 years ago curated the groundbreaking post-human exhibition, and Alexandra Pirici, who is participating as an artist in the Milk of Dreams with a work titled Encyclopedia of Relations in the Central Pavilion, will give first a short presentation and then have an inspiring conversation. They will open to questions towards the end, so please hold your questions until the end. We'll be wrapping up things around uh, 7 p.m. I also want to quickly mention the next meeting on art event, which will take place tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We will have queer theorist Jack Halberstam and artist Julia Cenci, Candice Lean, and Mariana Simmet on a conversation around queer visual culture and surrealism. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speaker of today. Rosi Braidotti is a graduate of the Australian National University and holds a PhD from the Université Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne. She is a distinguished university professor and was the founding director of the Center for the Humanities at Utrecht University. Her main publications include Nomadic Subjects, Nomadic Theory, The Posthuman, and Posthuman Knowledge. And her last book, Posthuman Feminism. She co edited Conflicting Humanities with Paul Giroir and Posthuman Glossary with uh, Maria Lavajova. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, a member of the Academia Europea, and holds a knighthood on, in the Order of the Lion of the Netherlands. Jeffrey Deitch has been involved with modern and contemporary art for 50 years as an artist, writer, curator dealer and advisor. Daichi's first important curatorial project was Lives, a 1975 exhibition about artists who use their own lives as an art medium. His influential exhibition, Post-Human, was presented at five museums and foundations in Europe and in the Middle East between 1992 and 1993. Jeffrey was also very generous to provide access to the PDF of his groundbreaking um, curatorial essay, which you can download on the website of labiennale.org. Uh, Deitch's Vanguard Commercial Gallery, Deitch Projects, produced more than 250 projects during his 15 years history from 1995 to 2010. From 2010 to 13, Jeffrey served as the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and in 2015, re-established his art advisory firm and his art gallery in New York City. Alexandra Pirici is an artist with a background in dance and choreography who works across different mediums. 
She choreographs ongoing actions, performative monuments, and environments that fuse dance, sculpture, spoken word, and music. Her work has been exhibited with the decennial art exhibition, ex exhibition sculpture project in Munster in 2017, in the Romanian pavilion at the 55th edition of the Venice Biennale, and now in the 2022, the Milk of Dreams uh, in the Central Pavilion, but also at Tate Modern, at the New Museum in New York, in Art Basel Messeplatz, the ninth edition of the Berlin Biennale, Manifesta 10, the Centre Pompidou, and many other venues. We will begin by listening to Rosie Braidotti, who will be giving us a keynote lecture on the video, and then we'll come back to welcome the other guests. So please welcome Rosie Braidotti. Dear friends and colleagues, I'm delighted and honored to participate in this meeting on art, albeit in a virtual form. I would much rather be with you in Venice, but times are what they are. It is my task and privilege to say a few words about posthuman feminism. Although I know that other participants in this meeting, very dear friends like Marina Warner and Jack Halberstam, would also address the issue from their own perspective. For me, posthuman feminism is both a concept and a navigational tool that offers a series of roadmaps into the posthuman times that we're living through. And my engagement with the concept takes the form of a specific methodology that I think is one of the great contributions of feminism to contemporary scholarship that is grounded cartographies and mappings of where we are at and politics of location, politics of imminence, um, in politically informed, theoretically driven maps of our historical social locations so that we could better make sense of what is happening to us with a strong focus on the question of subjectivity. Um, and together with, with cartographies, roadmaps, comes the, the figurations, the modes of representation that we give to the particular locations that we are analyzing. For me, being a feminist subject means to be embodied, embedded, relational, accountable for the, our knowledge practices and for our modes of interaction um, with the mechanisms that produce knowledge and representation. And all of it driven by what I call the ethics and politics of affirmation, which is what I will come back to in my conclusions. So locations being situated, speaking from somewhere specific, starts with embodiment. And this Biennale is a magnificent example of bodies at work, embodied, embedded location, put to the task of understanding the contemporary world. And the, and the forms of representation that we enact to give shape to this knowledge are crucial to the whole exercise. Critique and creativity are combined. The political and the aesthetic imagination work together, not in an opposition dialectical mode, but in a collaborative, uh, process-oriented manner to try to make sense of the complex, contradictory times that we're living through. And I must say that as I walked through this heartwarming exhibition assembled by Cecilia Alemani and her, and her team, particularly the Central Pavilion and the Corderia dell'Arsenale, I really felt that the posthuman predicament had reached full maturity as a hermeneutical tool and also as a mode of intervention on our troubled times. I think this Biennale captures the intensities, the speeds, and the scale of the anxieties and promises of our era. It is a great achievement and I'm very, very proud to be part of it. So I define the posthuman condition as the displacement and the restructuring of the position of the human as a result of our own socioeconomic um, progress, the strength and the intensity of our technologies, and the great progress that we have made. So it's not as if I woke up one morning and I said, oh, let's all go posthuman. It, the the posthuman is a feature of our historicity. It's something that emerges from what people call the fourth industrial revolution, which is the convergence of AI, of stem cell research, nanotechnology, the enormous technological advances that have a huge impact on our lives, on our society, on the way in which we relate to each other and we represent ourselves to, it, to, 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 to ourselves. But the problem is this great fourth industrial revolution occurs at the same time as great upheavals, enormous crises of which the climate 
change has become almost the representational mode. Um, we have great expansion and great extinction. The sixth great extinction is upon us. So, so we have a convergence of uh, contradictory effects that displace the ways and the modes in which we think of ourselves as human. And I summarize these uh, modes of interrogation on two basic lines, a critique of humanism and a critique of anthropocentrism. Um, Post-humanism focuses on this idea of the dominant subject as the man of reason, as my teacher Jenny Lloyd called it, um, a human standard of Euro Eurocentric universalism, whereby the human is assumed to be masculine, white, urbanized, speaking a standard language, described in a reproductive unit, full citizen of a recognized polity. Anybody who's been at the Sistine Chapel, a masterpiece of human genius, and has seen an older white man touching the finger of a younger white man, both equally authoritative, brilliant, and, and divine, will know what I mean. That man that passes himself off as universal is in fact very culture specific. It belongs to a culture, a polity, a moment in history and it is defined as much by what he excludes as by what he includes in his self-representation. And all the real life people who happen not to coincide with the vision of the human are less than um, that, that human so glorified and represented. To be less than means to be different from, and to be different from means to be worth less than. This is the lesson of feminism, but also anti-racism, indigenous theory, post-colonial theory. The negative connotations given to difference, and, and this negative connotation given to difference means that we may all be human, but certainly not to the same degree, not to the same extent, and it is absolutely the case that some humans are infinitely more mortal and vulnerable than others. The sexualized, racialized, naturalized others whose social and symbolic existence is disposable and unprotected is the starting point for a feminist reflection on the human that we may have been, will have been, maybe are, and on the posthuman that we're in the process of becoming. Um, I think um, that humanism has a, a kind of an exclusionary, limited side by being so culture specific and essentially attributing the universal to, to the European worldview. At the same time, humanism has also supported, particularly since the 18th century, a program of equality, a process of emancipation, which for all of its limitation has allowed for revendications of equality to emerge from the sexualized and racialized others, though dehumanized others, those humans that are less human than a man of reason. And these are the great emancipatory movements that we do owe to the humanist tradition. So for me, humanism is always a yes but type of relationship. And if you look at the discussion about the posthuman in race and feminist theory, then you would find a range of positions, some of which would defend humanism. Um, I will return to this um, in the next section. Post-anthropocentrism, or the critique of anthropocentrism, is a different ball game because it assumes that you actually have a language and a disposition to critique anthropos, to critique the human as a species, a species that is assumed to be dominant and far better um, than all the others put together. The decentering of anthropos challenges the separation between bios, the, the, the life of humans and, and socialized beings, from zoe, that is the life of non-humans, of animals. I mean, zoology and biology are two different domains of knowledge. And that distinction, bios and zoe, is fundamental, certainly, to the practice of the humanities and the philosophy of the arts. Um, uh, these are humanities, uh, and the humanities are, are, are biocentered, not zoe-centered. I think that the times that we're living through uh, th this great reorganization of knowledge through the fourth industrial revolution and more specifically the climate crisis and, 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 the, and, the, and the crisis and the sixth extinction force 
a, re a re-examination of our relationship to the naturalized others, to animals, to plants, and uh, to bacteria, to all these non-human entities that we simply had taken as things until now. In some cases, and I'm thinking of liberal feminism, this new relationship to the non-human results in humanizing them by granting to animals, plants, the same human rights as granted to the humans. This is, for instance, the position of a very distinguished uh, feminist philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, who would actually grant human rights to all living entities. Um, and today, politically, we have national states um, that are granting human rights to rivers, to mountains, to lands, to protect them from economic exploitation. So legal theory is recognizing the non-humans as interlocutors. In other cases, and I'm thinking of queer theory and delegating this to my good friend Jack, transversal alliances are proposed across the dehumanized humans and the non-humans. So queers, animals, plants, bacteria, algorithm codes, a great big alliance that would be a sort of the, the rebellion um, of the margins. And I think this is one of the most exciting frontiers of posthuman feminism, the insurrection of the less than human, uh, the non-humans um, uh, that are claiming to displace the centrality of a specific vision of anthropos. Now, what I find amazing in this Biennale is the extent to which the human-non-human -human interaction is being explored and examined from a variety of cultural traditions, aesthetic practices, and political positions as well. It seems to me that Alemanni has um, adopted a very affirmative posthuman sensibility in refusing to reduce the naturalized entities, animals, plants, the earth as a whole, to the negative pole of being things or objects, adopting a methodological neo-naturalism neo-materialism that actually allows her to engage with a variety of non-human others, uh, producing one of the most effective, one of the most spectacular moments of togetherness and of interrogation of the boundaries of being human. Um, and I think um, respecting the specificity of each location, of each non-human entities, while stressing our interdependence, is a balancing act that is of the greatest importance in the world of today. Uh, in, uh, the, in the feminist tradition, the first traces of this interrogation of the human, non-human boundaries date back to the 1980s. So that's why I, I always say in some ways feminism has invented the posthuman and uh, the, 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 the world-shaking uh, manifesto for cyborg of Donna Haraway is from 1985. 85, uh, Laurie Anderson equally world-shaking song, or oh, Superman, with a very famous sentence of holding, hold me mum in your electronic arms, um, in your uh, psychopharmaceutic arms, um, uh, or oh, Superman is 1981. Um, so to imagine any antithesis and your position between feminism and the posthuman is not to know the history of feminist ideas. Um, black feminism, notably Afrofuturism, have been been playing with the idea of human non human interaction since the early works of Octavia Butler and the very first um, uh, black sensation movies of the 60s. There's a whole tradition of this um, that I think we need to re examine in an affirmative manner to see um, that the nature culture divide that is in some way foundational to feminist theory, since the day that Simone de Beauvoir says that one is not born, one becomes a woman. So nature culture are set in opposition. Well, that is all very important and true, but there is also another tradition that has questioned this all along, saying we are in this together, we are made of the same matter. Um, also crucial and inspirational for this whole discussion is the much more ancient knowledge system um, of indigenous cultures and non-Western cosmologies. Um, and it is one of the strengths of this Biennale that the indigenous perspectives from South America, Canada and Australia are really very well represented. And also from Europe, um, thanks to the Sami pavilion of the Nordic countries in Giardini, which is absolutely a statement of how other philosophical systems have approached the question of nature culture as a continuum 
and not as a divide. And now dualism is in some way the madness of the West and the mind-body partition. It is one of the tragedies and the strengths of our great culture. All of this to say, questioning the human along these lines is the situation that we're in. The post-human critical turn is upon us. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the feminist take of it is an intervention on a discussion that is ongoing. And in relation to this discussion, I want to say, first of all, that feminism has very early prototypes of the posthuman turn, and it has invented it to a very large extent, so it should be very much involved in the ongoing discussions. And on the other hand, dominant posthumanists today, most of them white male engineers, also need to engage with the feminist and other radical traditions in order to have a more inclusive understanding of what it is that you become when you become posthuman. The dominant form of posthumanism in our culture is called transhumanism. And it is very integral to uh, advanced capitalism because it puts the technology to the use of, first of all, understanding, decoding, and commercializing uh, everything that lives. And cognitive capitalism uses knowledge and research, notably stem cell research, but also data from computational system to make money, um, to capitalize. And, uh, it, the new capital is data and information. Uh, but the transhumanists also believe that the human is an ancient model. It's an obsolete model. Um, that the old human has a neural system that is slower, seconds, but slower, than the computational system that we have created ourselves. Our bodies fall apart. We age and die. Horror for the transhumanist. So the answer is human enhancement. Make, make, put technology to the service of improving the performance of the humans. I mean, the transhumanists are based in places like Oxford, um, with Nick Bostrom, um, uh, John Lovelock, 101 years of age, recently said that the future generations of humans will be the cyborgs, and may they be uh, merciful upon us. And we all know what Elon Musk is up to by giving barcodes instead of names to his children and putting his billions um, to the service of creating life on Mars. Well, I hope he goes quickly and stays there. Now, this dominant transhumanist ethos is what a critical posthumanist of all kinds, but certainly posthuman feminists, really question by saying that the brain is not a black box that you can abstract from the rest of embodiment. It is embodied and embedded, we think, with the entire body, not just with a neural system disconnected from everything else. And um, the reduction of um, the mind to a brain and the brain to specific computational speeds is a horrendous reduction. It's a mistake. Um, and, and it's a mistake that philosophy has been uh, discussing for over a hundred years, since the very early days of the Vienna Circle, um, since Sigmund Freud brought in with psychoanalysis an understanding of how deeply intelligent is the flesh. And I think the concept of the flesh through phenomenology, through psychoanalysis, through surrealism, through the artists and writers that looked at the erotics of knowledge as well as the aesthetics of knowing. I think that these are lessons that need to be brought into the discussion. I think the work of Leonore Fini, Eleonora Carrington that are so central to this Biennale are profoundly important reminders that we need to think again of what you mean when you say that the human is a thinking animal. Um, and and, 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 and not to reduce the capacity of thinking to speed of computation. They are two different uh, things. So the posthuman feminist position is always yes, but fantastic excitement at the great technological advances without sharing the euphoria and the profound inhumanism of the transhumanist, um, uh, reminding us that we were not human in the same way to begin with, so we couldn't possibly become posthuman in the same way if a major mutation is now ongoing. At the same time, posthuman feminism is not technophobic, is not in a panic um, about what is happening to us. We are not bioconservatives who want to cling on to the national 
order, we would like a nice open discussion about the different types of posthumans that we could become. Experimenting with multiple ways of undergoing the metamorphosis, the mutations. And I believe that this is what Cecilia Lemani and her team have achieved with this Biennale. Experimenting with multiple transformation, metamorphosis, mutations. We need different roadmaps. We need to engage with different forces, make different alliances with heterogeneous entities in order to come up with a multiplicity of prototypes to oppose to the one-man model, the transhuman is trying to shove down our throat. We remain committed to social justice. We remember that one third of households on earth don't even have electricity, let alone be prepared to, tran to, to sort of uh, uh, transpose themselves to Mars. Um, and we need to sort of get a life to stay grounded, to stay real, um, and to engage with the radical epistemology and the voices of the margins in order to prevent that this great posthuman challenge becomes a repetition of the worst aspect of the old world. And I think here posthuman feminism is an archive, is a, is a source, is a data bank of knowledge that should become of general use uh, for anybody interested in these discussions. Crucial to the feminist insight is this tension, a creative, productive tension between difference, groundedness, and specificity. We differ, but we are um, in this predicament together. We are grounded, um, but we are not one and the same. Um, to be differently positioned according to the politics of location or of imminence that I already mentioned means that we have different genealogy, different history, we come from different stories, traditional narratives and cultures. This is not fragmentation, this is not relativism, it's diversity embedded and embodied. Epistemologically, it becomes a form of perspectivism. We have different perspectives, which is again not relativism, it's diversity. In the history of philosophy in the West, perspectivism is embraced by Spinoza, by Leibniz, by a whole tradition of, of um, philosophers of imminence that question the transcendentalism of pure reason and prefer to oppose to it the grounded perspective. We are grounded but we differ, we are rooted, but we flow. We are specific, but we are in this posthuman predicament uh, together. Negotiating these shifts, these alliances, is the big job of feminist theory and practice. And I think art practice and is one of the most relational tools we have to try to construct a, a common alliances, to construct a subject, we, that is not a colonial appropriation, that is not an amalgamation, but that function as a unit that can, for instance, um, oppose and resist the more reactionary, the more exclusionary tendencies of dominant transhumanism. To those who fear that the post and the posthuman will prevent the process of emancipation of those who were not human to uh, begin with, I say, I share their concern, but it is also becoming painfully clear that those dehumanized or marginalized others are missing out both on the profits of the fourth industrial revolution and they are overexposed to the da damages of the sixth extinction. They're missing out on both sides. So we need to make sure that there's that position of the marginal others um, is recentered. Um, otherwise, we miss out on both sides. We need to be much more involved in these discussions. For me, the post, the post and the posthuman is a moving forward, not a looking backwards. It's a, it's a blueprint for the future. In the rest of the time that I have, and it is little, uh, I want to quickly sum up the building blocks of posthuman feminism to give you an idea of what the tools are, trying to refer them back um, to what's happening in this fantastic Biennale. The first one of, that I need to say little about, the critique of humanism. We've said enough, um, uh, man is not the measure of all things, not European man. Um, the decolonial approach has to be the starting point. Um, related to that, uh, the critique of cognitive capitalism. Transhumanism is not the only form of posthumanism that, that is around. It's not even the particularly best one. It's the one the Silicon Valley prefers, 
is the one that capitalism prefers, it doesn't mean it is the best. The capitalization of living matter through technology, biogenetics and computational networks um, uh, is not a way of enhancing the human. It's a way of reducing the range of diversities and possibilities. And I think we, look, we need to look again at how biocapital, how the consumption of all that matters, um, is, uh, of all that lives, is at the center of contemporary research. And here, scientific institutions like the universities have questions to answer, put limits um, to the idea the data is, is an information, is capital. Critique of anthropocentrism, third building block, I've said enough. Um, uh, I think we need to look again at what species equality would look like. Different possible alliances, I repeat, um, uh, the indigenous traditions, great source of inspiration, transversal alliances between de dehumanized humans and the non-humans, also possibility, but all sorts of um, arrangements are possible. It's a moment where the human and the human are dancing together in a cosmic dance of joy and experimentation, and as if we were free at last of a very restrictive model of what it builds to be human. The fourth building block is one that is the dearest to my heart, the philosophies of materialism, of embodied or carnal empiricism, as I call them. And this is for me where feminism has been, since particularly the 90s, the feminism of my generation, post Simone de Beauvoir, has been extremely creative in looking beyond the mind-body divide and a notion of embodiment as embodied intelligence um, uh, that pr propels us forth to experiment with other ways of knowing, knowing differently. Um, and I think this takes multiple forms. Um, in some cases, and it tends to be a little bit where I go with my Deleuze and Spinoza readings, it can become a form of strategic renaturalization, that you almost overemphasize um, the biology, the naturalness, uh, the body part, to make a point that maybe culture was nature all along, um, that maybe you cannot keep those divides um, as much, um, uh, and that relational modes of looking at the intelligence of situated bodies is what we need to be looking at, and that's where the artistic practice, again, can be so central. Number five, immediately connected to this, yes, we are material, but this material for us is always technologically mediated. Look at us today, look at how we're communicating, um, where would we be without multiple modes of mediation. So the materiality, the embodiment is always already technologically uh, embedded. Here I think my teacher Deleuze and Guattari with their idea of multiple ecologies, um, technology as our second nature, just as nature becomes dematerialized. Um, the idea that we are grounded um, in a life that is human and non-human, Zoe, that certainly is planetary, geo, but it is always technologically mediated. Zoe, geo, techno bodies, what fun. And um, what immense possibility of exploration. And this would be a critical form of denaturalization. Can you see the, the diversification with the neo-materialism? We are in strategic rematerialization. If you take the digital, path, it is a form of critical re-naturalization, but there are both ways of dealing with the same challenge, different facets of the same spectrum of this redefinition of the human. Connected to this, again, number six, one of my favorite, sexuality as something that pertains to the structure of matter. Sexuality as before, beneath, and beyond gender. Matter is sexuate. Sexuate um, as in having the ability to relate to a multiplicity of others um, uh, in, uh, in the pursuit of pleasure and self-survival, um, also known as reproduction or replication. Um, the, the idea of sex with matter, the erotics of matter has a long history again in philosophy. It is very strong in the feminist philosophy of, of Lucy Rigueray, um, of and, and, and other 
psychoanalytic-oriented oriented, surrealist-minded thinkers um, who remind us that gender is a social construction. Sexuality is a cosmic force that is shared by human and non-humans. Um, uh, everything that lives is sexed and only some of us are gendered. So the idea of gender as a mechanism of capture, socially oriented, and sexuality as a much stronger transversal force, an elemental force, I think is where post feminism reconnects most powerfully to the surrealist, to the early psychoanalysis tradition, to a phenomenology of the flesh um, that questions the binarism of um, social constructivism. Built into this is what I call the ethics of affirmation, which is um, really the core business and my conclusion. And uh, I think the idea of creating these alliances, of living with these experiments, of reasserting the promises of the flesh, is a way of constructing affirmation as a binding force. Affirmation is not silly optimism. Affirmation is extracting knowledge and wisdom from the sheer awareness of the pain of marginalization and exclusion. Affirmation is the praxis, the labor, the process by which together we extract pearls of wisdom from our pain in order to create paths forwards, to create visions, scenarios for what we're capable of becoming. And this becoming, this praxis, is not linear. It has a temporality which, just like the time capsules of the, of the Biennale this year, are not in a, on a flat time scale, but zigzagging through, just like memory does, particularly when memory is linked to the pain of marginalization and oppression, reworking those traces of pain together um, in such a way as to envisage possible future is the challenge of the posthuman, and um, particularly um, of a posthuman feminist turn that asks the question, what is the posthuman future of those who were never fully human to begin with? What is the time measure of the posthuman feminist um, project. Um, I would say now, forever, all at once, is the temporality of feminism, inexhaustible and always about to self-combust back into life. Feminism, by any other name, endures. I wish you all a wonderful time in Venice. I wish I was there. Thank you, Rosie. Hi. I hope you can hear us. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite to the stage our two guests, Alexandra Pirici and Jeffrey Deitch. And Rosie is here live on Zoom. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. This was uh, really, really inspiring. And I will leave the stage to Jeffrey, who will start with the presentation, and then Alexandra, and then we'll open up a conversation among the three of them. And then, of course, we'll love to hear from you and your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Well, first, I want to say what an honor it is to be on the stage with Professor Bretati and Alexandra Perici, whose work I really admire. And I want to say what an extraordinary exhibition this is. Cecilia, I think you have curated with your team one of the greatest art exhibitions of the decade, one of the best exhibitions I've seen in a long time. And this show is historic. And it will have a resonance going on for many, many years. So post-human. So this is the 30th anniversary. It, it's, it's the precise 30th anniversary. It opened 30 years ago, about this week, uh, in Lausanne, Switzerland. And it, it was conceived as something, say, much smaller than what it became. So I, for a year or so, had been developing an exhibition with a working title of the conceptual figure. And I, I, uh, titles are very important in exhibitions, and titles of artworks. 
and conceptual figure was good, described it, but it, it was a little too academic. And running around the Central Park Reservoir one day back in 1991, it just hit me, post-human. And I was unaware of developments in philosophy. Uh, I was thinking, and more in the context of the art world, and the word post-human is conceived with a bit of humor. Uh, in, in art, you know, we have, of course, post-modernism, we had post-painterly abstraction. There are many posts, and uh, there's even a post-master's gallery. And I thought this was just, it was, it, there was a lot of humor in this. But uh, I think I really hit on something. So my interest in the post-human is, has aspects of philosophy and science, sociology, but I really come from the art context. And what I'm interested in is an aesthetic connection to post-humanism. And most importantly, to explore how artists look out into the future and have a great perception of the present to define our time. And as we face this post-human convergence, as Professor Panati refers to it, where we have a quite a frightening scenario coming with wealthy nations, wealthy industrialists being able to create in their mind the perfect human, uh, which might be quite retrograde in its Eurocentrism, male orientation, etc. cetera. Uh, how do we deal with this contrast between wealthy people who can create enhanced humans, post-humans, and so many of the others who don't have the resources? And are we going to be facing a situation like with the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, where a, a, a more enhanced species is going to wipe out the others, or perhaps there'll be a revolution where the ones who are unenhanced wipe out <laughs> the transhumans. So what I'd like to do, since number of you are, are not familiar with the post-human show from 30 years ago. Uh, I want to show some images of the art artists who were involved, first starting with some of the pages of the visual essay, so you can see what it was about. Uh, there is an essay that I reread for the first time in 30 years. I think it stands up pretty well and <laughs> predicted a lot, even predicted the pandemic. Uh, but you can read that on the website. I don't have to go through it. So let's look at some images. And, uh, okay, yeah, that's... Uh, so uh, the, the, the figure on the left is actually one of uh, great LA performance artists who's still around. We, we can go quickly through these, just uh, because in my experience, it, basically a few other art critics actually read your essay uh, most people don't, that I rely on my books often on visual essays. So we, we can go through this pretty quickly. So that's from 30 years ago. Yeah, th this is one of my favorite images from the book. So, some of the, these were quite radical 30 years ago. Now, it just, it's just routine. And the, this, the, the cult of celebrity and celebrity as an art form. And, well, there's Ronald Reagan. I, I never would have predicted Donald Trump, although Donald Trump is mentioned in the essay. And this is an example of what Professor Predatic refers to as the transhumanism. And 
uh, it's also fascinating the, the, kind of the, the concept of opening up life, so the concept of life, so it's not humans versus animals. Consciousness is a big part of it when we're looking at how the art world connects with this philosophy. And I'm, I'm very interested in changing aesthetics of self-identity. These are Americans were familiar with Betty Crocker from Cake Mixes. I don't know if people still even use these. <laughs> And this is one of the most interesting parts. Uh, so it shows how artists from the Renaissance onward are articulating new visions of what it means to be human or post-human. And fascinating to look at this through time, through, going through your, from Erasmus to Cubism. and we end here with Vito Acconci in the late 60s. Though all different artistic examples of the construction of the person. One of the premises of post-human, these are images of what was presented in the, at the Castello de Rivoli in Torino, was, was that starting around the 1960s in particular, people began to understand that they could create their own selves rather than accepting what they were born with. Oh, this is better. Okay, thank you. So th these are just some of the images from post-human. Okay, not, not very good images. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, the Kiki Smith tale. And so in the post-human, it's not just cyborgs. This is the other side of it. This, these, this is what is left behind by the technological advances. One of the key works, of course, is the Charles Ray, eight foot tall mannequin. It's sort of, it's sort of the key representation of the post-human in art. And the Paul McCarthy garden, the convergence of man and machine, but of showing the psychosis, the, the deterioration of the male model. And Robert Gover is also a key figure in articulating the post-human. Jenny and Antoni. Mike Kelly, another key figure. And Jeff Koons, who's probably uh, the the most prominent of the artists who might be classified as proto-post-human. He's almost post-human himself. Of course, Damien Hurst and you know, uh, we talk the drugs and biotechnology and changing consciousness. And a lot of post-human culture comes from Japan. It's a, a kind of post-human reaction. Martin Kippenberger, one of my favorite sculptures. And Marth Matthew Barney, who is an artist who w was just beginning at the time and who has articulated so much about the post-human condition.
so what I wanted to do now is just to show how posthuman had post the, the posthuman exhibition had a lot of influence on artists who came after uh, some who saw the show, some who were friends of mine we talked about, and how it it keeps going right up to the present. Of course, Murakami. Maurizio Catalan, who saw the exhibition and who might have a strong dialogue. Urs Fischer, who's also someone I've worked with a lot. And, and I don't know if we can show the video if this works. Th this is, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if it's gonna work. Okay, I guess not. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant video I, I would advocate that you look at, if, if you can online, it's of his robot chairs who have, who work on AI, almost like, like human-like brains. Oh, okay, that's all we need to do. did work. <laughs> and an artist I've been very involved with, someone else who saw the post-human show, is Vanessa Beecroft, and that's actually the, from the first exhibition in Deitch Projects in 1996. And this is a work that I showed recently. This is Soriyama, and actually Elon Musk bought one of these. <laughs> this is another contemporary manifestation, narcissist or performance artist I've worked with a lot. Uh, this is Jamie and Giuliano Villani. Uh, this is a painting in my collection, actually, and Jamie's in the current exhibition. Uh, of a very post-human figure. Um, this is one of the most celebrated and derided works of the past decade. This is Jordan Wolfson's female figure. It's, it's a interactive kinetic work. And this is Josh Klein, who also was adding to this tradition. Another Josh Klein. This is Ian Chang. It's one of the most interesting to apply in digital to this whole field. And this is Austin Lee, which I exhibited just recently, his self-portrait, viewing himself on the computer screen. Anna Udenberg. And a Frank Benson sculpture of Juliana Huxtable that was shown in the New Museum. Many of you have seen it also. It's a very post-human work. And this is Isabel Albuquerque, a work that 
I recently showed. And let, let's end with uh, America's post-human, let's say proto-post-human celebrity. Uh, and you're lucky in Europe, you don't have to deal with the Kardashians and every medium. But uh, this is uh, either a walking work of art or kind of a walking monstrosity or uh, the most influential celebrity in the country. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you all for having us. It's really a pleasure to be here. I will just continue and uh, do a very short introduction into my work. Um, I actually come from dance, so uh, embodiment and the body has had a really important place in my practice and my life. Uh, in the meantime, actually on the screen, you will see a very short slideshow of images from the work that I am actually showing in the Milk of Dreams exhibition, the work that is called Encyclopedia of Relations, and it's performed by um, 12 performers actually, but six at a time. Um, now to, to come back to, uh, yeah, to the more general introduction of uh, what I do. Um, I think it's also important to say that coming from dance, and I, I, I was trained in classical dance, and then I, I shifted uh, uh, towards more conceptual forms of um, movement practice um, and, and contemporary dance. And I think in, in the interesting uh, strands of contemporary dance, the body-mind divide is already obsolete. And uh, you, I myself work with, uh, with this uh, notion of body-mind, so somehow the idea that the body uh, contains knowledge and that we, you know, we think with the body uh, is, was very much already in line, I think, with new uh, strands of cognitive sciences that emphasize on embodied cognition and on how we think and we make sense of the world around us also because we're able to move or we're able to, you know, we are embodied and we're able to perceive uh, with our bodies and not with the sort of abstracted disembodied brain. Um, I think most of my works um, now take place in the visual arts, but I've also done works for theater early on. Uh, I became more interested in the openness of the visual arts, which is a double-edged uh, <laughs> sword, actually, um, and in the many possibilities that, that, that it offers, that, that the visual arts offer. Um, and for a while already, I think for more than a decade, I've also been working with what I call embodiment as a strategy, let's say, and as a choreographic practice where we, uh, or performers, I myself included at times, uh, try to embody something other than ourselves. Uh, and also in, recent, in, yeah, in the last years, in recent years, uh, I was interested in embodying something other than human. Uh, and I think there's a difference from a more, let's say, theatrical approach because um, I'm, I'm quite concerned with, with how we can, uh, we can put our bodies in situations and forms that, that uh, go beyond this uh, bipedal position. Um, and I think to use maybe a term that I think also Rosie Braidotti is, is using uh, in, her, uh, in her conceptualization of the posthuman, it's, it's a lot about a defamiliar, defamiliarization, so a disconnection with habits of thinking and also habits of moving. And um, yeah, I became quite interested in, uh, in challenging uh, our bodies to, to, of course, to metaphorically embody and to represent or to try to really express other life forms, um, plants, other animals, uh, sea creatures, and so on. Um, here, for example, in the image that you're uh, seeing, um, the inspiration comes from this phenomenon that happens uh, between trees of the same species or of different species sometimes, and it's called crown shyness. Uh, and the branches of different trees basically 
grow around each other without overshading, without touching and without uh, uh, overlapping with each other so that they are actually able to share uh, access to light. Um, and uh, of course, we, I translated that into a proposal for bodies in movement. Uh, and I think also in, within the work, it's not so much about really, really um, mimicking uh, or perfectly representing in a very figurative, very clear way uh, the, the, the trees, but it's also a lot about trying to incorporate and to experiment with a certain dynamic, a certain collaborative dynamic actually that, uh, that at this point uh, we also find uh, science actually, because it's important, I'm, I'm also quite informed by, by science and, and botany. Uh, that science makes available to us. So this insight into certain behaviors of trees, which are also, of course, intelligent, and they manage to collaborate rather than compete for resources. Um, uh, just to say um, a couple of words about the work also, so Encyclopedia of Relations. Um, I was interested in a sort of, uh, in a kind of productive tension and a productive contradiction. On one hand, I'm interested in also paying an homage to the concept of encyclopedia and the ambition of the encyclopedia as a format, which also has inevitably something to do with the uh, legacy of enlightenment, uh, but also challenge it, so uh, in, uh, challenge the idea that knowledge and the world uh, can be exhaustively or the, the, can be represented with this ambition of, of representing it uh, exhaustively and also through classes of knowledge, classes of objects, so through distinct areas, through, through distinct fields of knowledge and through distinct elements. So uh, basically what I proposed was an embodied encyclopedia of relations, so of elements that always come together to form something else. Uh, and there's also spoken text sometimes, so some moments are described by the performers, um, such as, for example, a moment when uh, waves meet rocks to form a shoreline. So the, the emphasis com is, is, is a lot on, on meetings, on connections, and on relations between things, it's almost saying that everything is made of connections and relations. And also moments that there, where there, are, there is no description of what visitors see, so that we leave things uh, more open to interpretation and we just leave the, the bodies to signify with no language uh, attached to the images. Um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think I would, I could close here. Uh, there's, uh, I, I think just to maybe refer to something from the uh, introduction, um, I do, I try to work across different mediums in the sense that I try to, to, to use knowledge or skills uh, from different mediums. I also use music in the works. I'm quite interested in polyphony, for example, at the moment as also kind of a non-modern or pre-modern way of training the ear into perceiving and also enjoying multiple melodies, so multiple courses of sound at once not a unified rhythm, not a unified melody. I'm also using a text, um, spoken word, um, and I'm also mixing actually in the work uh, bits and pieces of texts from different philosophers, different theorists, among which uh, René Descartes, uh, but also Edouard Glissant from his uh, uh, Poetics of Relation, Octavia Butler, also Karen Barad, talking about materialist philosophers. So all these things, somehow all these small pieces of text, somehow trying to summarize their uh, point of view on the world, but also uh, to emphasize on how one is always understood also in relation to another or together with another and within a whole history of thinking the world in different ways, including the Cartesian, uh, idea of a man of reason. Um, yes, um, and I'm also interested in, in, in trying to work through the lens of sculpture. And we've been uh, shortly talking about it before. I think 
anyway having bodies in a context such as an exhibition context which is uh, focusing the, the, the attention through a visual lens. So people anyway look at things, they are they're used to look at, at what they see there and they look, used to focus on form. So I think bodies anyway function sculpturally in an exhibition space and then if you, um, yes, if you give time, so if you don't work with a very fast dynamic, they, they, yeah, they, they, they become sculptural anyway. So I'm also, also interested in these relations between different mediums or between different art forms that uh, in the end, uh, uh, play uh, into the work. Um, I, yeah, I think I, I can close here and then maybe we can, if there's something that is uh, important to uh, develop, we can do that in the conversation. But, so thank you. And I guess Professor Redanti is still on Zoom with us. Oh, yes, I am. I'm here. <laughs> okay. oh, perfect. Okay. Well, then, do, I, well, first, that do I just, do we just plunge on? <laughs> okay, well, that was, it was it's, it's such a uh, impactful talk that you gave us. And uh, so I, I loved the energy you didn't even stop for a breath uh, <laughs> thank you um, i'm very sorry i can't be there i feel very very uh, frustrated and um i wish i could be there to celebrate and thank everybody uh starting uh well uh, to senior to toner cecilia for this amazing uh, exhibition she's put together but all of you really and it is a great pleasure uh, to meet jeffrey dice because that that yeah, i didn't actually get to see the exhibition but the catalog of which i hold a, a first edition has been very very important um in fact i think that one of the issues that we may want to think about post biennale or during um, is the, the relationship between the posthuman moment and the postmodern moment. Um, uh, there's quite a bit of work on that in philosophy at the moment in grappling with what I would call the flair for the artificial, um, uh, a kind of post-naturalistic aesthetic sensibility that is so well spotted in the 1992 um, work. Amazing, a really prescient, uh, in a sense, the postmodern end of authenticity um, and how we fall in love with these uh, completely glossy, totally non-natural representation. Um, uh, the body of, of Michael Jackson, but uh, the, the first of the bodybuilders, Jane Fonda, um, who started uh, what was going to become you know, body sculpting and, and in fact some post natural world order. Very interesting, a lot of ideas come to mind and we can't obviously do justice to them. But, but in relation to that 1992 moment, I think what I see happening now is like how much of this technology that, that we saw deployed around us has really come into us, so to speak. There is a real new intimacy with, with um, the digital, with, with the genetic, with the, with the post-natural. Um, uh, and of course, the, the fact that we're communicating the way we are right now shows how Technology is the second nature, um, and any naturalistic framing today would have to take into account um, uh, the technological and the mediated, um, and that really does things to our bodies. And the other thing I want to say that I want to talk too much is obviously how femininity and masculinity, how gender systems get completely restructured in the process. And in the posthuman book, you probably know uh, Mr. Deitch, I start by quoting your exhibition and saying this image of the, you know, the, 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 the business woman in her uh, suit, um, the new femininity is how they explode um, and how the, the new masculinity is how they implode and the new uh, technologies of gender. And I think we will hear more about this tomorrow. I know Jack Halberstam will, will go into it, but I think it is one of the lines that connect the postmodern and the posthuman um, moment. Uh, and the love for, for celebrities, how celebrities 
celebrities are, the new sacred figures, the new icons, um, and how you can talk of uh, Lady Gaga. Um, uh, again, Jack does that very well, a Gaga feminism, or you can talk of a Madonna feminism, you can talk of a Beyonce uh, feminism. Uh, these popular culture figures, which were still a little bit a kind of other uh, in the 1990s, are now completely familiar. They are, they are the the, the new icons in almost a religious sense of the term. I could talk about this for hours, but I thought that between the, the embodiment as relational mediation on the one hand, and Jeffrey's ideas of how media comes into us. So we are, there's a new kind of intimacy with these images. We have new forms of embodiments. And I think that this Biennale forces us to rethink the simultaneous rematerialization and dematerialization of what we used to call our bodies, ourselves, a long time ago. And, uh, but the pluralism of that, the plurality of that remains, I think, very relevant. Yes, it's so, so inter interesting to think of that feminist slogan, our bodies, ourselves, relationship to what's going on now. Indeed. Now, I, I'd like to ask you a question It's more like a, a political question, okay? so. There, there's a, a very wealthy friend of mine who described his process of breeding his almost post-human children. It was a whole process. He started, he put an advertisement in the Stanford University newspaper to find the ideal female candidate. Uh, it's close to the horribly discredited uh, eugenics that uh, associated with Nazism. Uh, and and it was, with the whole process of how uh, he had a genetic laboratory work with the egg to make sure that the embryo was perfect, gave him exactly what he wanted. And um, then uh, 10 years pass and I ask friends, so what's going on? And we'll get, oh, the children are really a problem. But, uh, I want to ask you, you know, if there, someone introduced me to their clone dog. And, well, it's really only a short step from Dolly the sheep to a clone dog to a cloned person. And from your perspective as a feminist philosopher, what do you think should be done? Should there be laws that you know, no, you're not allowed to genetically engineer the so-called perfect human. Of course, the perfect human comes with all kinds of old biases. Or is there something that should be done with social action? Or do we just accept this? This is the course of evolution. It's a great question that would, as you imagine, require a little bit more time than we have. But um, I think it is absolutely true that since the, we mapped the human genome, uh, it is clear that we have now understanding and knowledge of the basic codes of life. And uh, we have made a consensus in the human community, in the scientific community, that the human genome is not to be commercialized, is not to be exploited. It is a kind of... A, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legacy and her heritage for all of humanity. But we also know, and the universities and the research centers are at the core of this, that right now our medicine, our genetics, um, our nanotechnologies are capable of producing new materials, new forms of life, basically from scratch. Um, um, regenerative medicine is where you see the good side of this, um, that we can you know, grow organs that can be used for trans transplant. Uh, uh, to, we can do all kinds of intervention on the bodies. The transhumanists think that we can even eliminate old age and death. That's pushing it a bit far, but longevity in the wealthy part of the world, life expectancies has grown incredibly. Where all of this begins is with animal breeding. And if you look at the feminist scholarship on animal rights, a very early um, you know, eco-feminism down to the work of science and technology people like Sarah.
Condoli, the sheep, and Madonna Haraway herself, they have been tracking how what we call animals are really bioengineering. Um, what we call food and, and agriculture is biogenetic. I live in the Netherlands where everything is genetically recombined. Uh, one of the great agricultural forces of nature is the Netherlands. They have no real land. Everything is done <laughs> through some sort of um, industrial genetic um, intervention. So from uh, plants, food, animals into the human, over the last 30 years, capitalism has become cognitive, has become a system that controls and makes living systems. Um, this is an incredible scientific moment. I'm a woman of science. I you know, open my Prosecco and say, my God, the things that we're capable of doing. And then of course comes the critical moment thinking, whoops, where is this um, going to go? How can we um, sort of regulate? How can we discuss? How can we control? Uh, the system. And this is, I think, one of the great unspoken elements of the big transhumanist projects. The fact that Elon Musk has given barcodes to his children and not names tells you where transhumanism is going um, uh, towards some sort of elimination of the old humanity. And reproduction is at the core of it. Um, and here we would open a very thorny issue where I think we need to agree to differ on the positions that we take. If you look at the scholarship, it ranges from really bioconservative feminists that are saying, my body, myself, don't touch my uterus, my reproductive power is what defines me, uh, leave me here. Um, and it, this is very strong among, among the young the younger generation were even refusing, of course, chemical contraception. Uh, some of my students are even becoming you know, pro-life in the sense that they don't want any intervention upon their body. And at the other extreme, completely, um, I would say almost passionately, a technophilic um, uh, feminists were saying, let reproduction go into um, the technological system so that we can be freed of the burden of it. In feminism, this idea of let technology do the reproduction for us so that women can be free has a long history and um, dating at least back to the early 1970s with Shulamit Firestone um, in, in the dialectics of sex that really takes the Marxist idea uh, that if machines can liberate us from labor well, then machines can also liberate us from the labor of reproduction. So I think these are almost two extreme cases. And what I plead for is that we don't make this an oppositional binary war, that we make it two extremes of a spectrum within which all of us will have to find their position. After all, some form of technological intervention is part of our lives, um, from taking the pill to taking an aspirin to vaccination. None of us are pure and untouched by science and technology. M sort of negotiating new modes um, by which we accept that generative medicine can make us live longer, that reproductive technologies can make the, the whole situation run more smoothly, some kind of relaxed, maybe a cooperative discussion would be nice and um, would be welcome. And it would be also very democratic. And I think it's very necessary that we enter this agreeing from the beginning to differ. We will never agree. There cannot be one model to become posthuman. There has to be at least an enormous range of varieties because we can never just agree, I don't think, on one prototype. Have I avoided your question successfully? Perfectly, perfectly. <laughs> okay. Alexandra, so what is the role of the artist in facing this posthuman convergence? Hmm, that's a real, quite heavy, um, a big question. You touched on this already. Yeah, I mean, maybe to link a little bit also to, to technology, and I will speak about myself as an artist, because of course, different artists uh, approach uh, the times we live in differently. Um, 
I think I, I, for me it's really important that I actually work with other human bodies and especially in the arts where the norm is that objects are taken care of better than humans. So objects receive a much better treatment and there's more investment in objects obviously than in life and in living labor. So for me, uh, again, uh, working with live human bodies is super important. When it comes to technology, uh, for example, I've always tried to also incorporate in the works that I make some reference to technology and um, a reflection on technology, even if most of the works don't feature anything other than bodies, so there's no screen, there's no circuits, there's no internet sometimes. But for example, there is also in Encyclopedia of Relations, um, um, a moment of embodied uh, artificial intelligence, so where performers embody a neural network and they ask the visitors to label images, to help them label some images. And I think that when we speak about technology and, and the post-human, it's also important to make visible the incredible big amount of human labor, hidden human labor that props technolo technological systems. So when we speak about artificial intelligence, we speak about millions of click workers, people who do the work of making sense of the world for machines, who teach machines how to see, how to hear. So there's an immense amount of human life and human labor in this other than human systems. Um, and I think for, for artists it's also impo uh, important to or also for me, from my perspective, is to make visible human labor also and uh, the, the human bodies that are, are anonymized and that are glossed over also in this whole uh, hype about technology, about uh, yes, human enhancement and uh, you know, when, when we speak about uh, incredible advancements in robotics and, and again AI, with AI this has really um, boomed. I mean, I think every state and everyone is uh, every individual is so interested in, and, and it ha the artificial intelligence has been presented as such an incredible force and such a, uh, yeah, thing, a thing that somehow becomes disconnected from human agency, also in movies and so on, and in fact is deeply connected to human cognition, human uh, um, ca capacity of interpreting the world for these systems and is, is hiding an incredible amount of of human life that is badly paid and you know poor countries, um, yeah. So I, I don't know if I, I have uh, I've answered the question, but I think the role of the artist is also to make visible the less visible, visible aspects of the of the times we live in and the post-human condition. Very good line to make visible the less visible. <laughs> Thank you. But also, if I may, both of your example of the freedom and the and the talent of setting up experiment, being able to experiment with other ways of representing, of framing, um, of reflecting um, in a way that the academic disciplines really cannot. We are constrained by so many conventions, methodological traditions, um, allegiances. Uh, I've always found the, the, the art as a research practice is absolutely crucial if you're trying to think your way through the present, the contemporary. And of course, the university, particularly in the humanities, tend to be much more devoted to the past than to the present, because we don't have vector, a way of entering the contemporary. I think art is such a vector, and I think it's becoming much more cognitive, much more research um, oriented than, than it was uh, when I certainly started um, 30 years ago. Yes, definitely, sure. But there are also, just to, to add maybe a short note, there are many constraints in the arts as well. There are really a lot of constraints. Again, maybe they're not all visible, but again, it comes to very material things like funding, the design of exhibitions, so many things actually that maybe they don't read out in, in the final exhibition, but they're there. So we're also navigating quite a, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, borders and constraints. I can imagine. Yep. Alexander, I'm fascinated with your reinvention of medium of sculpture, bringing in the tradition of dance, music, performance. But there's quite an interesting tradition of this that has go back into early 20th century. And I want to ask you about your particular approach to art. 
that is sculpture, but it's also performance? Um, to be honest, I, I mean, I think there are so many artists and also many, not many, but quite a few choreographers, so people who come from the performing arts and from dance, who have been working with the notion of sculpture as well. And since you men mentioned the beginning of the 20th century, actually a big inspiration for me and when it comes to sculpture comes from dance and from the work of Václav Nijinsky, who was a, a very gifted, um, quite well known as a classical ballet dancer. He worked with the Ballet Russe of Serge Diaghilev. Um, and in the beginning of the 20th century, so between 1917, 1920, he created this, he made his own choreographies and he created these groundbreaking pieces of uh, dance. One of them is called The Afternoon of a Fawn, which is very sculptural. So it, it, it was a complete uh, shock for audiences at that time, also because his works were shown uh, together with a repertoire of more classical ballet dance. Um, and he, if you look at the works of Václav Nijinsky, especially after the afternoon of a fawn, but also he, he did a uh, rite of spring uh, on the music of Stravinsky, it, it's super sculptural, also quite slow movement-wise. Uh, he was also inspired by art objects as sculptures, like museum sculpture and uh, Greek vases. So for me, actually, this would be one of the earliest inspirations, uh, 19, yeah, 1917, if I'm not mistaken. I think this is the year he created Afternoon of a Fawn. Um, it, it was actually a dancer and a choreographer who worked with a sculptural body on stage. So it was presented to the audience as a dance that was really, really sculptural. And I think it's also, it was a scandal. People left the theater. They said, what is this? Uh, and I think it's a very radical proposal, especially because it came in such a different context. So in a, in a space of movement, not in a visual arts. Uh, and I, yeah, for me, he is, uh, he is one of the early inspirations. Also, it's, it's maybe one of the first instances of the portrayal of sexual ecstasy on stage. Exactly, yes, yes, it's true, yeah. And then, of course, there are many, uh, many other works, and I think I'm definitely not, I, I don't think I would, thank you for, <laughs> for, uh, for, uh, for saying this, but I don't think I'm reinventing uh, sculpture. I think, again, um, somehow, I'm just framing bodies in a certain way to emphasize on their sculptural aspect. But um, yeah, so many um, other artists are, are, I think, are doing also or working in with the same uh, proposal. So I, I want to ask uh, Professor Bredotti. So in shaping your philosophy, are are you in dialogue with artists? I'm curious as to how deeply y you are engaged with the art side. Oh, it's a great, great question. And I have um, found myself um, over the last 20 years almost, um, uh, I would say unconsciously, but um, it's pretentious, um, unwillingly uh, working uh, with, uh, with curator and artist, being, being drawn towards them. I did a lot of work with Tate Modern, uh, Casado di Rivoli, and here in Utrecht with the Bach and Maria Lovayova, with whom I did the Dutch Pavilion in 2007. And now this extraordinary conversation with Cecilia. Um, because precisely of this, what I perceive coming from the academic constraints as the ability to work on representation and work on bodies and experiment. Uh, I don't have one um, artist that I say this is it, but I have not missed a single exhibition of feminist art since WAC back in 2007, the one at the Centre Pompidou. Uh, there's been a whole wave of uh, feminism and art in the last uh, 15, 20 years. And I, I traveled miles to make sure that I got exposed to those um, images and that I could see what was possible. It's as if art gave you a measure of the possible um, in, in a way that, 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 that the constraint of philosophy do not, thinking the unthinkable, um, representing the unrepresentable, as Gilles Deleuze says, is, is the task. Um, but where do you draw inspiration from? I should add, because this also came also across in what Alexandra said, that sound and soundscapes 
are probably the most constant companions of what is the very solitary work of writing, which is still my medium, but I hope that that will stop now and I will do other things. Uh, but the music that one writes and thinks with, I think is crucial. And I've, I've, for years I've been wanting to do a project where I would really interview um, people and say, what, what music do you write to? Or do you write in silence? I don't believe anybody writes in silence. Um, so I have had my Max Richter moment and I've had my women composers moment. I have my Adele moment. And people sometimes send me tapes of soundscapes that are made to think posthuman bodies in action. And what strikes me is that the relationship to that particular art form that is the acoustic space becomes completely invisible and unspoken. Uh, my, my teacher Deleuze wanted to write a book on music, he didn't. It's the book that he specifically did not write. He wrote about theater, he wrote about painting, he could not write and he had an incredible relationship to music. So there is something about the soundscapes, maybe because it goes into your psychic depths and that remains um, unexplored. And I would say that, that there is a rhythm, particularly to this last, last book that I, I consider my last academic book, that is certainly um, a music, uh, a musical score um, of affirmative, rebellious, uh, marginal, weird um, soundscapes that I think has helped me along. Um, I think I suffer from art envy. Um, I see, uh, I, I knew a very, very young Barbara Kruger. She was already doing things um, in, in the late 80s that we philosophers could only dream of. Um, so avid, uh, in admiration, in awe, feeling inadequate in relation to the, what I perceive as a superior skills um, of the artists, um, particularly in the feminist tradition. And I think this exhibition for me is just the absolute proof. You just simply have to drop on your knees and simply say, amazing. Um, what Fini, what Rego, what, what these women have, have done and are doing. So I want to ask uh, Cecilia Alamani. Cecilia, would, would you like to ask some questions of the speakers? Okay. <laughs> Is there somebody with a microphone uh, in the audience? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Alexandra. Um, I wanted to ask if you are um, informed by feminist theories and uh, what are the theories you read or, and inform your work? Um, yes, I, I think I am, of course. Um, I mean, I think I can mention the usual names from Donna Haraway to also Karen Barad, for example. And of course, uh, Professor Braidotti also. Uh, was important uh, for uh, for me and of course Sylvia Winter for example maybe it's worth uh, mentioning uh, I mean it's definitely worth mentioning in, in general but in, in my case as well um, bell hooks also um, I think it's, it's this is complicated now with the names because it's one of those moments where uh, yeah, if you forget something, then uh, th that tends to be to become important, and the missing names become to uh, become important. But yes, I am very much informed by, uh, by I think, or I'm I'm interested in feminist theory. Shulamit Firestone was also uh, very important, I think, uh, for me. I actually also <laughs> I'm going to be as modest as I can, but I, I want to mention this. I. Uh, I even wrote together with a curator and friend, Raluca Voina, um, a feminist uh, manifesto, a sort of techno-feminist uh, manifesto that came out actually at the same time with the Xenofeminist manifesto, so with the Xenofeminism group, and which I, I still, uh, I, 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 I held, and I hold dear, and I'm, uh, Patricia Reed is also, I think, an important uh, name. I would say we're friends, and she's also quite important, I think. Her thinking uh, is important for me. Um, yes, so I am informed by feminism. I don't explicitly 
let's say, uh, mention this about my work, but uh, it's definitely there. I think it's, it's definitely there. It's difficult not to. It is, it is one of the great cultural forces that runs from the second half of the 20th century into the 21st. Feminisms in the plural. You know, how, how can, I think it should be just part of the, you know, every day's um, uh, common culture. Um, uh, it now covers everything, as I said, from Beyonce to the most radical fringe. Um, I just wish we could sort of accept it and, and stop resisting it. Um, uh, and all these cultural wars that have been created around the feminist tradition when in fact it should be read as one of the great long traditions of reflection on what it means to be human indeed with, with the black tradition, with the indigenous tradition. Uh, it's a pity that we have this uh, gender wars coming in to throw smoke in the eyes when in fact feminisms in their huge diversity are simply part of the history of ideas um, and, and should be taken in a very relaxed manner um, as, as such. Um, and, and so that, that would be my plea um, as well. And it is already there in the 1992 um, uh, uh, exhibition of, of, of Jeffries, where you see the, the crucial importance of the sexual politics um, of this operation, of the takeover of the, of, the, of the human body. So how can you do that without uh, feminism? And yet the resistance and in Europe in particular is, uh, is enormous. Um, in the United States, uh, where abortion is about to, 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 to be lost. So, I'd just like to plea for the banality of it, the crucial importance of it, and, and the relevance of it. And, and I forgot to mention Beyonce was also very important. Of course, but Bell Hooks wasn't happy in Alexandra, as you know. She thought that this was not radical enough, so it's a very interesting conversation. I know, I know. But... <laughs> so I want to ask of, of, of who are the post-human feminist icons? Who are the, the leaders in the wider culture? So we mentioned Beyonce, Lady Gaga. Are these also post-human feminists? Oh, um, absolutely. We could go around the room and people will give you different, um, uh, different names. Um, uh, Monet is one in the Afrofuturist traditions. Um, there are multiple, so we say multiple sources. Um, uh, iconic, absolutely. How could it not be uh, Donna Haraway because she writes the Cyborg Manifesto in 1985. But equally iconic for me, and I said it in my lecture, uh, Laurie Anderson that, that writes of Superman in 1981. Um, and then uh, Shulamit Faris on 1973. Um, uh, and then uh, Octavia Butler, um, even earlier, um, with her Afrofuturist uh, manifesto. And then the first eco-feminists um, uh, are in the early 80s, Val Plumwood um, and her indigenous friends immediately joining in, Bird Rose and the other. Um, it, I think it's the rhizomic web of multiple figures. And what I think happens between the postmodern generation and the posthuman one is obviously massively internet, which means that the knowledge production practices change um, and they're much more collective, crowdsourced and distributed. And I think this more distributed character of knowledge production, which I welcome wholeheartedly, changes also the role of the icons um, or um, the, the stars, if you wish. And then it will be really interesting to discuss this. Um, but a lot of my uh, graduate students and even the ones interested in the arts are, for instance, resisting the idea of the star curator. They say, oh, how old fashioned. Everything today is crowdsourced and collectivist. I don't know how true this is. And I put this to you people of the art world, but it seems to me that the image of the intellectual, the philosopher king, has finally shifted to something a little bit more democratic. And so I would say a multiplicity of sources um, where once a concept emerges and if the posthuman is this convergence of the ecological and the digital, this balancing act becomes the navigational tools, we could probably find it back in, in, uh, in Lucretius and the pre-Socratics, um, we, can, we can find elements of it absolutely in Spinoza, who was a technician. Spinoza made optical 
um, instruments for a living. Today, Spinoza would be a programmer and a hacker. No question of that. Um, the, the, a moment a concept emerges, I think the genealogical lines get redistributed. And, and for me, apart from the obvious names, it's a multitude of smaller minority sources and a lot of the black indigenous, especially the indigenous traditions saying you have to revision the nature culture divide. You have to think again. And a lot of minority subjects um, pushing, in a sense, at the gates of this Cartesian dualism, saying this is not the way it goes. Final annotation, this distributed character of knowledge, of course, advanced capitalism is right there. Um, the, the, the commercial side of it is data collection um, and, and data, uh, the, the Facebook phenomenon, the fact that we are never off the grid and that we are being um, uh, tracked um, almost constantly. So how to design these technologies differently, uh, the alternative algorithm, I think, community, which is also very, very strong. I think that's one of the fields um, that I follow with the greatest interest. We need to be able to make our um, this distributed character of knowledge and the algorithmic underpinnings of it. We need to make them more democratic, more open. We need to have some answer to Mark Zuckerberg um, and get off the grid uh, and stop making money out of tracking our own attempts to reach out for each other. That's, that's fascinating. Well, there, there, that's, that's a, a book. That's a book ready to be, your next, that can be your next book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with big books. We can do one together in the spirit of, of crowdsourcing. <laughs> Alexandra, I want, want to ask you about the presentation of your work. So here it's in a confined situation, sort of an elite context of the Venice Biennale. I seen you've also on outdoor works at monuments. I want to ask you about what really interests you in, in presenting your work uh, online, in the public. Do people need to know that it's actually a performance or they just stumble into it? Is that interesting as well? Um, yes, just to start with the end. Yes, I, I think for me it's really interesting to show work in the public space, outdoors, let's say. Um, with, even when, when it is uh, presented as such, also people tend to miss the signs or something. So it's it, because it's not a context, context where you always expect an artwork, of course it becomes a surprise. And I think that's really interesting for me. I've received some of the most consistent and interesting remarks on works from regular passers-by. Uh, so uh, I, I do believe in, you know, in the capacity of art to speak to an not necessarily interested or hyper-educated public and hyper-educated audience. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in showing art also outside of the traditional art context. And I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm doing work uh, outdoors. When it comes to the online, I think the only work, if I remember correctly, that had an online component uh, was a work uh, called Signals for the Berlin Biennial in 2016, where uh, um, a content ranking algorithm uh, was deciding what gets to be performed in the exhibition space, and uh, audiences could interact and they could make decisions. So there was a list of stories or news uh, that could be performed and then people would have access to this list either in, in the exhibition space on screens or online on the website of the institution and they would click on what seemed more, more, more interesting to them and then this algorithm would index and then weight those clicks according to many things, location, the device that you would use to click, um, the time spent on the website and then would assign different weights, so different importances to this online interactions, uh, and then it would create a top 30 most relevant uh, stories to be performed. So it would create, it was also commenting on how relevance is constructed online through algorithmic decision making. And we also had, I, I, I mean, I, we, the performers, the project, I tend to think collectively as much as possible. Uh, we had these screens in the exhibition space that were also detailing the construction of the algorithm. So how, how we decided on the, 
the decisions that the, 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 the software would make. Um, and I, I think of that also as, an, as, a, uh, as a work presented half online, let's say, or that had an online component, and where they also someone that did not get to see the exhibition or did not get to see the, the live, let's say, part of the work, uh, actually could stumble upon this website or could interact with it and also have agency, so produce something into, in the exhibition without having much to do with it, in fact. I'd like to hear another question from the audience. Thank you, everyone, for uh, the presentation. So I have a question, um, like a comment question to uh, Professor Braidotti. Um, so I relate a lot to what you were saying about sound and writing. So I come uh, as an artist and writer, um, theorist. I also have, mm, I don't see this uh, disjunction, at least in my practice, between making theory um, and making art and um, but also I, I, I follow for example in, in writing a book um, that there, there could be a phase where I can only listen to an album uh, in repeat and then there's a moment that I have to change album and somehow that music is absorbed in, in what I'm writing and I um, so that that was really resonant for me I was also, mm, when, uh, when you quoted sound art, um, I was wondering, for example, uh, all, the, all the experiments that are coming out nowadays uh, in um, using um, DIY microphones, or for example, uh, antennas, this is, for example, experiments that I personally make, where you create um, you know, in real time, these soundscapes where, uh, some, like, like Alessandro was saying, you make visible or audible the invisible um, mm -hmm. by, for example, uh, listening to microwaves or being able to touch uh, uh, the magnetic field and perceive it and make, it, uh, you know, create reaction to that. So this is also challenging uh, somehow the. the the, the physical body, the idea of the body through through a technological means. So, would you would you um, inscribe uh, those experiments as something that has to do with the post-human? And also, somehow, there's um, a wave of women uh, sound artists, um, myself as ex name Marta Zapparoli, uh, who are actually in, in devising those. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, apparatuses that can really uh, trigger new forms of perception, that can, you know, oh, also okay. surpass the bias, so... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Extremely interesting. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, soundscapes is exactly the tapes that people send me, the files that people send me, that range from having recorded the sound of whales and uh, bird songs, or my favorite, insects. I'm crazy about insects. They're the most amazing music makers. Can't beat an insect when it comes to soundscapes. Um, two people, indeed, that have highly mediated and um, uh, radio-oriented um, type of uh, sound um, and music. The thing about the soundscape so broadly defined is that it is cosmic, it's planetary and cosmic. It is literally the sound of outer space. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's totally non-human in character. The strength of music out of all the art forms is it really is the least human. Um, I mean, the, the sounds, the, 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 I mean, the songs of birds, of course, we know, but of any of the other species, most extraordinary. Um, and I think something that then classical music formats in a certain manner, and it is something that I've always struggled with because I, I don't particularly like classical music, obviously, but I also see the efforts that they make. Um, and Deleuze in his seminars always talked about how the, how the, uh, the, 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 the philosophers were trying to, as some of the music composers were trying to imitate the birds. The idea that, that art is non-human per definition and tries to uh, become earth and become animal and become machine and become other, break the boundaries. And um, I think it is, it is uh, one of the most fascinating things. My own private practice, you're going to laugh, is ringing bells. I am a, a, an official bell ringer of the mighty city of Utrecht. It took me 
18 months of training to, to learn to ring a bell. And the bell is, of course, the great grandmother of internet. It's a signal system, it's a musical system, it's made of metal, of rope, human strength and collective work. And it has a power of expression that is most extraordinary. And so when we design the soundscapes by ringing our bells, I really feel that I'm reaching out both relationally um, and in some ways uh, beyond language to a multitude of others, um, under, underexplored, uh, the concept of bell ringing um, uh, as a code. It's one of the most ancient codes um, that we have. So this has been my personal practice, as you can see, very elementary and very manual. Um, um, but it is the moments where I feel that, you know, the motto, the medieval motto of the bell ringer is, I call the living, I mourn the dead, and I break the storm. Because with the bell ringings, you can break. Uh, the cloud accumulation and prevent the worst in times of heavy storms. So cosmic terrestrial planetary collective soundscapes are absolutely uh, something that I'm totally into and fascinated by. The bell ringing, that's fascinating. So when can we go to Utrecht? And ah, we, the there is a website. You can hear all of our bells are most extraordinary, uh, very ancient. Um, but the, the most ancient that we have or that we had were in the Ukraines and in Russia. So the most ancient bells in Europe dating back to 1200, 1300. Don't get me started on bell. I will speak for hours. Uh, Venice has some beauties. Um, but in Italy, they're all uh, rung mechanically. And, and a bell should not be rung mechanically, should be pulled by hand, and you should engage with the effort of rope and metal and sky and strength to extract that sound. And the first gong is when you know that you're part of a cosmic ensemble. And it is for me worth every symphony in the world. The first time you go bang and the bell gets started, pure joy. That's wonderful. That's an unexpected aspect of your I practice. know, I know. I'm a very strange person. <laughs> <laughs> well, any other questions that will bring some interesting comments like this? Uh, well, I, I would like to go back to celebrities. Um, we know how much uh, um, Greenberg or Adorno or Keimer uh, have um, condemned whatever is kitsch, let's say. Uh, let's use this term, which is not appropriate for all the authors. But um, still, um, you, Jeffrey Deitch, have uh, shown in your catalog, post-human catalog, not only um, Michael Jackson, but also Madonna, and, and now you have shown uh, Kim Kardashian, and um, we have... Um, heard the name of Beyonce, and also Cecilia Alemani um, has put something about celebrities. Um, uh, Josephine Becker, for example, is a, a, an important presence in one of the capsules. Um, yes, Josephine Becker proved to be very avant-garde in, in a way, but still, um, what is the role of celebrities in playing the model? Are they selling us something? Should we go on considering them just uh, kitschy, uh, well, let's say, models, uh, or uh, are they telling us something in advance and we should reconsider the, the role of the media um, somehow? Also, considering that Mm, some of them uh, uh, have been sort of crucified uh, because of their uh, capacity to be uh, like innovative. And I want to go back to, to uh, David Bowie or to, I mean, there has been a long tradition of celebrities that were also experimenting on their own bodies. So there, the question is about the relationship between mass culture and uh, our culture, which uh, can be very elitarian sometimes. Yes, well, that is quite a central question. And the way I look at it today, we, we, Clement Greenberg wrote this famous essay 
in the 1930s, the avant-garde and the kitsch, well, if we look at things today, there's a collapse between the borders of avant-garde and kitsch. When you look at artists like Jeff Koons, of Alex DeCourt, who's getting a lot of prominence now, who was in the last Biennale. So, yes, uh, the kitsch can, and avant-garde don't have necessarily th that much space between them. So I'm fascinated by the way celebrities can become an extension of performance art. So we look at the tradition for Marcel Duchamp as Rose Selavy and Salvador Dali, Andy Warhol. But then you mention David Bowie and think of for contemporary celebrities, some of them quite elevated in their practice, some much more trashy, uh, that the consciousness of these kinds of great art performance innovators have extended into the broader culture. So a Kim Kardashian type celebrity is aware of a lot of the artistic tradition. Um, she works closely with Vanessa Beecroft, for example, and uh, the skims come a lot from Vanessa's costumes. So uh, it's, the, this is part of a larger question that fascinates me of how what starts in the art sector, what starts here at the Venice Biennale, extends into the broader culture and it's extending very quickly. And you know, we know now that a number of the major fashion designers are involved with artists. Uh, Balenciaga just gave a big fashion show that they, where a third of the attendants were artists. So this is uh, a new extension of the art experience. And uh, a, a certain sector thinks this is just terrible. This trashes it all, and you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of this myself, a lot of criticism. Um, uh, on the other hand, it, uh, the, it makes the experience of every, everybody's life more stimulating and be more artistically enhanced. It's a very big question. Um, if I may, I would just like to add that I think that the dynamic goes both ways. There's also a lot of popular culture and mass culture going into the arts. I mean, every museum has an Instagram account. I don't think it's, everything just goes one way, or this idea that in the high towers of art, then everything happens here, and then it sort of trickles down into society. It's also a lot the other way around. I think we're, this is a context that is deeply informed by uh, you know the political, social, economic, and cultural reality uh, around it. So it's it's a double. I think it's definitely a, a both ways kind of thing. And Professor Predati, we would like to hear your perspective on this too. Well, it's um, a, a crucial question. I was thinking how the technology influences our a relationship to celebrities and when the term celebrity really comes into the picture because would you think of Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir as celebrities? Not really. Um, uh, philosopher kings maybe. So it's something that really has to do with media culture with first the television era and now absolutely uh, the internet era. When Andy Warhol said uh, again presciently that um, soon everybody will be famous for 15 minutes, he said famous, that it was about fame, which may not be the same thing as celebrity. Uh, for 15 minutes, the only thing that he got wrong was the time frame. I mean, 15 minutes is eternity. I think now you're famous for 30 seconds on Instagram, if it, uh, or the space of a one, one Netflix um, a season, if. if um, um, so the celebrity it has some sort of meta stability in a world where everybody's famous for 30 seconds. Um, and I think, I think we should interrogate ourselves that the the attachment that we have to certain figureheads. And here again, Jeffrey's work from the 90s, spot on, that you 
kind of embrace certain iconic figures in an almost religious fervor. Um, David Bowie is up there with with uh, with, the, with the gods. Um, don't get me started on David Bowie. Um, but but um, Adele has 65 million people on her Instagram account. I can't even begin to comprehend what that would mean. And in intellectual life, we have the same. We have figure figureheads that stand also markers for certain political cultures, clear in feminism, mostly um, Americans really, and they become the markers for certain uh, collectively created movements of thought. Uh, but I would say that the rise of the celebrity in media culture is directly proportional to the decline of the classical figure of the intellectual that is really completely obsolete as a figure that we don't have intellectuals, we, we don't need them. Um, if they exist, they're highly ideologized. Um, so there is probably a, 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 a new division of labor, which I think may be connected to the new modes of, of knowledge production. I think when Beyonce speaks in on behalf of feminism, she does change the world. I really disagree with Bell Hooks um, on her condemnation of that. And thank God we have her on our side. Um, when uh, when celebrities in their famous Hollywood speeches defend one cause or another, they are actually exercising a fundamental intellectual function. Um, and what are universities asking us professors to do? To have Twitter account, to have Instagram account. We were recently urged to a Spotify list um, of our podcasts. So, so to, in a sense that we are asked to imitate uh, the celebrities in, in a role reversal that I find fascinating and also worrisome. So we need a cartography, the, 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 the philosopher kings, the intellectuals, um, the famous um, uh, celebrities, uh, symbolic figures, icons, but ultimately it's the internet and the algorithms that decide who gets the hits <laughs> and, and who counts and who matters. Well, thank you very much. We're uh, a little past seven now. If anyone has urgent questions, you can come up and speak to us directly. And so first I want to thank Professor Bredante. This was really amazing. This was uh, thank you. Also fascinating how uh, effective this was over Zoom. And yes. you're really right yes. here with us. And Alexander, it's really great to get more context about your work. Performance is marvelous. Most people, I think, have seen it. And I want to thank again Cecilia Alamani and the team for inviting us and for presenting this extraordinary exhibition. Thank you. Have a Prosecco for me. Bye. <laughs>